It was a great pleasure to host a conversation for this morning's proceedings at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario Conference. I spoke with highly accomplished leaders on the evolving challenges for women in leadership roles. They are Ontario's Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell, former Liberal MP and Cabinet Minister Jean Augustine, and Elizabeth May, the former leader of Canada's Green Party and the party's former member and now candidate for Saanich Gulf Islands. Here's that conversation. I can't begin to tell you what a thrill it is to speak to the three of you. Um, we're year two of this pandemic. We've all had to learn how to readjust our expectations while navigating a global crisis that is essentially out of our hands. During this uh, past year and a bit, Ms. Dowdswell, uh, you connected with municipal leaders across the province of Ontario. What stood out to you the most from the conversations with the province's female mayors and heads of council? You know, I had the great privilege during COVID to reach out to leaders of all kinds, uh, some municipal leaders, but some in hospitals and uh, first responders and schools, all kinds. And I had private conversations with them, essentially asking them how they were doing. Because, you know, people assume that leaders are invincible. Mm -hmm. They don't stop to say, how are you? And they'd laugh and say, oh, you're really serious about this. And then I heard poignant stories, people clearly grieving, but I heard wonderful, wonderful stories of collaboration and creativity, community building, courage, all of those kind of things. I can't tell those individual stories, but what it allowed me to do was to gain a real perspective about how Ontarians were coping all over this huge province. And there are some lessons that, uh, some observations that I would draw, and mm -hmm. I've been able to tell those uh, stories internationally. What are some of those if lessons? I, if I can give you a couple of examples, mm -hmm. the first one is immediately out of people's mouths. It was, isn't it wonderful to see all orders of government collaborating, working in common cause? Uh, it, it was saving the people that was so important. And, and then, of course, immediately saying, why can't it be like that all the time? Then there were lessons about uh, trust and confidence that was being built in science. We did some amazing things in the healthcare field. And so the lesson was, this is real evidence-based policy making. Why can't we do that on other issues? We also learned some tough lessons about interconnectedness not only how interconnected we are to uh, people all over the globe, this is a rare event that touches every person on this planet. That, that's so unusual. Um, we also learned that we still operate in silos. So our economic system and our social system is disconnected. Even our healthcare system, who would have thought that that didn't include people in long-term care homes, for example? So we learned that lesson. And we learned the lesson about inequities. The fact that I could still work uh, meant that others were taking risks for me. It was the precarious workers who, uh, who drove, um, who delivered things, who, who were on the front line in the healthcare system, who, who stocked the grocery store shelves. Right. And so the real conclusion that I would draw is as we rush back to some form of normalcy, I hope it will be a better normal, not the old normal, but also I hope that we will find space and time to really reflect and have conversations that are genuine about who matters, what matters, who is essential, because those are the kind of conversations we go through thousands of Zoom calls in this past uh, period of time. And so often I'm left saying, the right people aren't at the table. Mm. There seems to be this um, kind of partisanship. If you wear uh, a blue hat, then that means something. If you wear a red hat, that means something. How important is it to acknowledge the collaboration that's happening behind the scenes, um, especially amongst women leaders? It's always dangerous to make generalizations, but in my experience in politics, it's far easier to work across party lines with other women. Mm 
Uh, and I found it, for instance, when I was first elected in 2011, the, it was the election of a majority Harper government. And I remember talking to some of my colleagues in other parties that really we all found that the ministers who responded on the basis of the issue were more prepared to roll up their sleeves and work with us as opposition party members. Were people like Diane Finley in Harper's cabinet or Lisa Raid in Harper's Canada cabinet or Rana Ambrose. So it, again, it's a generalization, but my own experience in, in, in parliament has been that it's, a, it's quite possible to accomplish a great deal. I mean, number one, if you don't care who gets the credit, that also helps. But but deciding that what really matters is the collaboration and creating the kind of, of, of nonpartisan climate where you can get things done. I will also say that from when I first started working in Ottawa, when I worked with the, the Minister of Environment back in the 80s, we had far more collaboration in Parliament. Parliament was much less partisan than it is now. Uh, it's it, the hyper partisanship that's been brought in with this business of um, and an, another um, I mentioned a woman political expert, but she's not in politics is Susan Delacourt, who wrote a great book called um, Shopping for Votes that details quite specifically the increased focus on dog whistle politics, wedge politics. Uh, I also wanted to mention, of course, in this COVID economy, this was a she session. I'm sure you'll come back to that. But I don't think it's uh, uh, what well, I think it is significant that for the first time in Canadian history, we have a woman as Minister of Finance and that it's Christian Freeland as Minister of Finance, who's brought forward that as a response to COVID, we need universal child care. I mean, we've all known that a very long time, but it looks like we may be able to actually, through federal provincial cooperation, deliver much, for Canadians. Um, much as um, we talk about uh, women and women's leadership. And I was reading something recently that talked about 190 something countries in the world, only 21 uh, has a woman either head of state or leader. And uh, how well those countries did in terms of making the decisions based on community concerns, based on whatever, and on, on the science and health, and not on the financial resources of the country. At the same time, as, as a woman who is usually caught in this intersectionality of being woman and being black and being minority and being immigrant, et cetera, I think it's important that when we talk about women and women's leadership, that we make sure that the diversity and inclusion of all the voices of, um, the voices of all women in all the, um, the, the different uh, capacities and capabilities, et cetera, be included because oftentimes um, the discussion goes around the needs of the majority in, in some instances, which in corporate boardrooms, in the Parliament of Canada or the Senate or wherever, we find that the women are mainly white women and that the, the, they have to, there have to be some discussions as to how we bring uh, these women and uh, bring the, the leadership qualities of those women from the margins into the center so that when we move forward, we move forward as a diverse and inclusive society. And this is always my harangue all of the time, you know? Well, since you mentioned it, you know, um, you made history, you, all three of you have made first for women. Um, but Ms. Augustine, you know, how did you deal with being the only woman of color in those rooms at times? Well, you know, as, um, as many people would tell you, uh, being in a room where you are the minority, where you are the only one, and oftentimes where your voice has to be echoed by a male in order for it to be heard. Um, it's that realization. And I was, and I, I was fortunate in that by the time I got to the Parliament of Canada, I had had several leadership roles. So I had been used to being able to maneuver uh, in uh, that in male environment. I was a principal of, uh, of a school with a family of schools where I was the only woman, I was the only black woman. I was uh, head of organizations, Metro Toronto Housing Authority and other places where I've had the opportunity to use my leadership skills, to develop my leadership skills. I have also been, um, as I was raised in, in Happy Hill, St. George's, Grenada, I think I grew up resilient 
I grew up with a grandmother who said, way before Obama's parents, uh, Obama's heard it, um, who said, yes, you can. As a girl, you can. And who pushed her granddaughter to excel. And, uh, and, and the old saying that you can only be put down if you let yourself be put down. So I was constantly fighting back, not in the sense of, of, uh, of verbal or in the sense of, of creating great big dissonance or, or kind of thing with, with uh, colleagues, but I never let anything go by, any of the microaggression, any of those things go by without addressing it either publicly or privately. Mm -hmm. Well, Miss May, um, I have to ask you about your successor, the current leader of the Green Party, Anami Paul. Yeah. Help us understand what's at the heart of these leadership challenges Anami Paul and the party have been struggling with. I'm not in a position to comment, ma'am. I'm the former leader of the party, and in that role, anything I say will be outsized and have a larger impact than it should. I'm not on council. Is that a burden for you to carry? Because I'm guessing, because you've been, you, you, you spend so much time, um, you know, uh, building the Green Party, and Canadians are right now thinking about who they'll vote for come election time. You know, on a personal, personal note, it must affect you in some way, does it not? Well, no, no. What I would say is that there's been, it, we try to get media coverage of, since I joined the Green Party in 2006 and became leader. I have to say, uh, we never had a, an easy time getting media coverage. And suddenly, any Green who has a gossipy point of view and wants to leak it is, is the day's um, poster child on various websites. What I would say is, and I think Annamie Paul will completely agree with me on this, is turn the page. This is not what Canadians want to talk about. We are going into an election. Annamie has made history. She is the first, and, and Jean made history in 1993, becoming the first black woman elected to parliament. And all those years later, finally, the first black woman is elected as the leader of a federal political party. Mm -hmm. We are in a climate emergency and people should vote green because there's no other party speaking to the climate emergency at all. I mean, I, I Justin Trudeau is a friend and I, the liberal policies are always justified because they're better than what the conservatives might've done. But again, nobody said to Theresa Tam, when she said we need to stand six feet apart, let's stand three feet apart because the conservatives would, would, would only give you one foot. So we'll give you three feet. So that's got to be better. No, on the climate crisis, we are required by the science to, to do far more. And only the Greens are saying that clearly. So I'm hoping that in the next election, we won't have people. I certainly don't find people on the, on the doorstep. I'm actually doing phone canvassing because of my knee replacement. I'm not going door to door yet. But I don't find people asking me about internal gossip that I have no role. I have no idea any more than anyone else reading the newspapers. So I'm not on council. I'm not involved. And as a former leader, I don't think I should comment. This is a country that wants to talk about real issues. And I, I hope that uh, putting aside whatever blow by blow people think they know about the Green Party, they realize, okay, so we're getting bits and snippets of gossip. Who cares? Mm -hmm. We have to talk about what matters. And just to, and, and um, respectfully, yes, I, I hear everything that you're saying. Um, maybe this is something that the media is focusing on, uh, but Ms. Augustine, I just wanted to get your view on it. You know, as Ms. May mentioned, um, Anami Paul did make history. She became the first black federal, uh, the first black person to lead a federal party. In your view, is this a situation of racism, poor leadership decisions, or maybe both? I think all of the above. Um, sitting and listening, and, and all I know is what I read in the newspaper. And, um, and uh, I agree that this is a time when we should be focusing on some of those issues that the Green Party faces. I'm very, very proud. I was very proud of Anna Nene when she was elected. Uh, I have watched her growing up. I know her family. At the same time, just putting, the, putting this all in perspective, I watch what happened over the years when black women get to the top of white, uh, what is traditionally white organizations. For example, if we look at an organization called NAC, the National Action Committee, when it was run by your, um, you know, uh, white women and supported by white women, supported at all fronts. When black leadership came into being and what happened to that organization and asking the question where they are today. So I think usually there are a lot of things at play and uh, where, why and how it got into the newspaper, why and how it has gotten to the point where it is, why and how all of those things seem to matter because you have to ask a question all the time. 
uh, is it because of her race? Is it because of her religion? Is it because of her color? Why doesn't the, um, the general membership see the importance of focusing at this point in time to ensure that they make their way forward rather on than you know, what are internal squabbles or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Dowdswell, I know you say that you're apolitical. This is not uh, a political question. Um, but, you know, we're talking about um, getting women into politics, uh, women in uh, positions of leadership. And uh, there's been a lot of women who have announced that they're not rerunning uh, in the upcoming election. What can our political system do to make it easier for more women and more women of color, uh, the intersectionalities, uh, to enter politics when we see some women who are very powerful leaving? Ms. Dowdswell? Let me, well, let me make an apolitical comment, uh, unlike my, uh, my two uh, friends. Um, what I want to say is that, that we're seeing all kinds of cracks in our democracy. And I think it's so important that we understand that democracy is not simply about government, it's not simply about voting, it's really about how we choose to live our lives together, how we make decisions together. And that's why for me, the local level, the municipal level of government is so very important. It's, a, it, it's almost forgotten most of the time, uh, people, uh, and yet, it's the level of government that is closest to people. And that's where I see hope. I have had several amazing conversations with the women mayors and councillors here in this province. And there, Hillary Clinton would have described it as having a responsibility gene. Uh, so many women have that kind of a breadth of experience. They, they live lives where they have to juggle everything. And, and so they bring different perspectives. When I sat in on a Zoom call with a group of women mayors in Southern Ontario and how they were doing during uh, this time of COVID, the conversation was so honest. It was honest, it was raw. It was people saying, these are my neighbors, this is my family, what can I do? How can I do X, Y, or Z? And there is, there's a humility, there's a vulnerability, uh, there, there's um, a way in which women approach empathy that is so important. And if we could only tell all of those stories, you know, when I, when I first started in this position, I realized that we don't tell our stories very well. And so I laughingly appointed myself the province's chief storyteller. And I do that because when you hear those stories, uh, and th they are remarkable stories, both, both really tough stories about what people are going through, but wonderful stories of courage. And that's where you need to turn to. So I know that, that Media coverage goes to the province, goes to the federal level of government. But I just really think that for young women wanting to get into politics, starting at, at your home, starting in your community is not a bad place to start. Uh, for one thing, you can make a difference. You can really see things happen mm -hmm. and you can, you can make mistakes. You can learn from those those lessons much more easily when you're not on a national stage, and I I um, I think that that women have have such a valuable role to play, and that's a good starting point. So I wouldn't want your audience to go away without thinking, as we've come through COVID in particular, just look at your local and your municipal government because often that is where real things have happened because uh, those are your neighbors. And Ms. Those are your neighbors. Ms. Augustine, the same question for you. Yeah, I think, um, I think that people like Barbara Hall come to and the memory of Pam uh, O'Connell, who started to have city council really look at the situation of, uh, of women and who had girls um, in, uh, in meeting in some kind of volunteer capacity so that they could shadow um, municipal uh, councillors to understand how uh, things work at that level and to encourage them 
to uh, participate in the political arena. I, I agree with you, Liz, that this is the starting point and has to be the starting point for women in so many different ways to understand the community, to know the responsibility that there is uh, for community and to ensure that needs are met on the ground. So we are now talking about a national child care. We're talking about so many things that are recognized by our mayors and uh, our female, especially the women mayors around this province. And, uh, and also among the, the, the councillors who are conversant with these issues because they, many of them have had those life experiences that they bring to the table that they could interpret because of their own life experience. And so it's a great opportunity over the next few days as these uh, municipal um, councillors and officers will be talking and deliberating. We know for sure that they're bringing to the table those experiences that women provide in leadership and at the same time pushing to ensure that those women are given responsibility um, council chairs or whatever they're called, uh, committee chairs in places where they talk about the dollars and not as um, in, in, that one is on a committee that's not making major decisions. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, well, it's, it's not good enough to be in the room. They should be at the table. They should be at the table and they should be in the committee rooms where the major decisions are made, especially around uh, funding uh, for programs and other things that matter to community. And Miss May, the same question for you. Well, I'm a big fan of the municipal order of government, and it's it's come from having worked, and I'd say again, it's the level of government closest to people. I mean, it's 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 odd that I chose to be a, a federal politician and, and be a federal parliamentarian, but I've loved every interaction I've had with municipal order of government, particularly, and I will say this before I was ever a member of the Green Party, working with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and setting up a program for climate action. So the, the Partners in Climate Protection Program means that the, the municipal order of government across Canada has done more on climate action than any other order of government. And a lot of that has been through the creativity and the leadership that said, well, we're going to have a revolving fund. I'll credit the former finance minister, Paul Martin, put it in place, but it's still working and it's creating these opportunities. So I think it's absolutely the case that women in leadership and women getting involved in uh, elected office will find it less partisan, less unpleasant, more uh, getting more done at the municipal order of government than you often find at uh, the, the provincial or the federal. And again, if we can scale back the partisanship, the hyper-partisanship and the sniping, that will create the climate that does attract more women to the federal parliament. I mean, right now we, we hit a milestone about a year ago that we had 100 women in parliament, still less than a third way behind many other countries around the world. I think we still rank 64th in the world in terms of the number of women representatives in our federal parliament. You find you can often find more women at, at, at municipal order of government, but if we create the climate that makes those spaces more respectful, uh, that makes them more productive, that makes them more collaborative, we will attract more women at every level of government. In our last minute here, I knew the time would go by so quickly. Um, we've been hearing a lot about building back better post-pandemic. Um, what are some of the questions that need to be considered as we look forward to the future and try to help women in leadership uh, positions? What work still needs to be done? Uh, Ms. Dowdswell, I'll start with you. Well, I think uh, there needs to be work done uh, to break down the silos of decision-making. I think there needs to be work done to, to break down the silos of people uh, that, uh, that exist now. And so the question I raised earlier, who's important, who's essential? Uh, how, how do we learn the lessons that we've already seen? We know so many people, to use your word, have been able to pivot uh, to make faster decisions, to reduce uh, bureaucracy uh, that's, that may be necessary. But for me, the, the critical one is really saying, we're learning for the first time, I think, mm. that in fact, we're not going to have a prosperous economy unless we deal with some of those 
what we used to call women's issues or social issues, that that framework, and in fact, what I would call the sustainability or the resilience framework is one that's going to work very well uh, to get us out of this uh, uh, challenge that we've been facing in a much better way. And Ms. May? Well, yes, I, for me right now, having uh, my daughter just turned 30, I was holding her in my arms. She wasn't one year old when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in Rio. Mm -hmm. So I feel a sense of monumental failure I feel despair, which I'm fighting off all the time because our children's future is hanging by a thread and we have months, not years to address it. So I am, at this point, I am a cranky 67 year old version of Greta Thunberg. I'm not letting anybody off the hook anymore. Incrementalism doesn't cut it. So as a woman leader, uh, to the extent I'm, <laughs> I'm running again, I hope to be reelected in Spanish Gulf Islands. I hope to see my honorable colleague, Annamie Paul as the member of parliament for Toronto Center in a parliament where we say enough. We have to be serious about the climate crisis in the same way we were about COVID. And that means that we have to actually walk the talk in this country. And that's what I will be doing as long as I have breath of life. Uh, Ms. Augustine, um, what about you? Well, differing with, uh, with Liz, with Elizabeth is not, <laughs> is not easy, but Elizabeth, I am hopeful. I am optimistic that what we've learned in this pandemic, who are the essential workers? Who are at the table? Who are the haves and the have nots? What we need to do to move forward in terms of our fairness and equity and justice, how we need to address those very serious issues that face us all in this global village. I am hopeful that the young people and those decision makers would have had something coming out of the conversations. And so I'm hoping that as we go forward, that we'll take as our mantra, diversity and inclusion, equity, fairness, and that as a society, we realize that we're all in this together. I really learned uh, so much from you and we really do appreciate you all making time for us. It's been such a privilege and an honor to spend this time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.